to infect us. So we think there are no shared universal values and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Vrijheid is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is robust. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. Yeah, good evening everybody, warm welcome. Welcome in the Bali. Um, my name is Tim Wagemakers. I'm program editor at the Bali. And you're here tonight on a very special night, which I think shows the many things uh, the Bali can be. And also uh, one shortcoming of doing things live. Um, um, let's just start uh, with that. Um, we are going to talk tonight about um, um, the, the couple of thousands Europeans that moved to, uh, to war zones in Syria and that returned and we're going to ask our question what should we do with those people, how can we prosecute those that committed illegal crimes and we have a very special guest who can tell us something or give us an insight on what it is to live in the countries, in the conflict areas where uh, ISIS has made such an impact in a devastating way. But before we do that, um, the reason for this program was that we've asked uh, Peter Omtzigt to come here and to talk with us about it. But, um, well, in the Netherlands, when it rains, it pours. And when you come with the train, um, um, his, the, you know the traction, the thing that goes uh, on top of the train was hit by a crane. So he's stuck in a field at Sassenheim. So um, um, I'm going to say how we're going to solve it later. But first, uh, Peter Omtzigt in the train made a short video message to us. Do we have it already? Yeah. And afterwards, I'll explain how we proceed <laughs> with the evening. So this was uh, 10 minutes ago, I think, and he was already in the train for two hours. Um, so um, if you tweet something about politicians, don't tweet that they're not willing to come, because he's been there for hours now. Oh. Sound? Well, at least. <laughs> you see, it's in the train. <laughs> Is the sound working? Yeah, it's in the train. Okay. Well, let me then just tell you before, um, uh, until it starts working, that, um, well, this shows one of the shortcomings of doing things live. You can't do, the, you can't do them uh, otherwise than you do them. But I think we still have an interesting night because. Um, tonight we're going to talk about um, all the things that are related to ISIS and they're coming back to Europe. But we're going to do it twofold now. Um, and we have uh, Bibi van Ginkel, for example, who is an expert on the legal framework on how you can prosecute uh, uh, people who committed atrocities. But um, this night's actually a bit more special because um, why do we organize these events? Um, we had last year the story of uh, Parveen Alhinto, uh, a, a Yazidi girl who was kidnapped by ISIS, and that was one of the, well, most remarkable events I've ever seen in the Bali because her story was so strong, and was so emotional. We've had the people from Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, uh, who do undercover journalism in Raqqa, and told us what it it is like to live under ISIS, and 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 we feel that, and that's why we do this. We need not just to give a podium to experts who can say something from the Netherlands, but to the people who live under ISIS, to the people who know what's going on there, and who are actually the real heroes that we wish to give a podium. So, therefore, I'm really happy that uh, Elisabeth van der Steenhoven, who is the director of uh, women's NGO Karama, helped us to put this night together. Um, unfortunately, of the three brave women that we invited, two of them had to cancel also last night, and that's also, I think, it shows already how difficult it is to make nights like these because one of them couldn't come to Europe and the other one has been traveling so long to tell her story and, and, and she feels she really needs to tell the story but she's so tired that she asked 
if we would excuse her. And now on the more positive note, because we have someone who I think I'm really happy to have, um, Susan Aref. It's a real pleasure to have you here, a real privilege. Um, you live and work in, in Iraq. Um, um, she's head of the Women's Empowerment Organization, a network that fights for equal rights for women and girls. And her organization um, existed already in 2004, but lately they've been taking care of countless ISIS victims in Mosul and also Erbil. And they were one of the first to arrive in Mosul after uh, ISIS uh, got, um, uh, well, um, uh, after ISIS left uh, forcefully. Um, and this morning she spoke with some other women uh, to the Dutch, uh, to Dutch politicians in The Hague. Um, and, and, and we're going to hear her story on what's it like to be in Mosul right now, on what's it like to live under ISIS, because I think it's important to put a framework to that. We also still have the short clip that the, the other brave woman made um, from Libyan's wo Women's Platform for Peace. And it's about, because very often, I don't know if you think about ISIS, you often think, or maybe it's only my fault, about Syria. But actually, if you go to Benghazi, for example, there are mines that are planted uh, by ISIS there. And the film shows how very brave men uh, are trying to dismantle this mine with very amateur equipment. So we're going to talk about that. And afterwards, Bibi was so nice and so kind to help us with providing a legal framework. And I hear sound. Does that mean? Sorry dat ik vanavond niet aanwezig ben bij de avond in de Bali. Ik zit muurvast in een trein al meer dan twee uur bij Salsheim. De avond vanavond is belangrijk. Het is voor het eerst sinds de jaren 40 dat Nederlanders in groepsverband genocide plegen. Deze mensen moeten gestraft worden voor wat ze gedaan hebben en om de Europese Unie in Nederland veilig te houden. Ik zeg bewust ook de Europese Unie, omdat we uitreizers gehad hebben niet alleen uit Nederland, maar ook uit België, Duitsland, Finland, Zweden. En uit mijn rapport blijkt dat in een aantal landen nog niemand gestraft wordt. Als wij echt het centrum van internationaal recht willen zijn en blijven, kunnen we dit niet laten gebeuren. En dit doe ik in het Nederlands, omdat ik het bijna niet durf uit te leggen aan de moedige vrouwen die jullie vanavond zullen spreken. Heel veel succes en sterkte vanavond. Sorry. Ja, Pieter Ontzicht. Um, so, as said, the setup will be as follows. We will talk first with Susan Aref, and then we will talk with Bibi van Ginkel, because I think there are many people who also know quite a bit about the region or about what's going on there. Please pitch in um, um, after an hour if you want to say something or have a question. Um, and of course, there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, I think this program will be like an hour and 15 minutes, after which I'll bring you to the bar for a drink. And there's one last thing tonight. Um, which I need to stress because we have a live stream and everyone can talk freely. But um, um, I've been learning these past few weeks that ISIS, uh, Daesh, ES, whatever you call them, are quite keen on tracking people down. Um, and, and they do that by searching on social media um, uh, the, the combination of people they search and uh, the name of their organization. So please feel free to Twitter and do whatever you want. But uh, please do not combine in any way ISIS, ES, or Daesh with the name of Susan Aref, because that could cause quite some trouble. And, um, well, w I find it quite brave that you're here, so we need to help you a bit uh, to make sure everything goes all right. Um, so let's begin, and um, I really like to... Um, Elisabeth van der Steenhef is going to join the conversation to help Susan uh, wherever necessary, but I think... You're also perfectly fine to tell your story yourself. Give her a warm welcome, uh, Susan Aref and Elisabeth van der Steenhoven. Yes, and you can talk in the... Yeah. Um, well... First of all, thank you for being here. You've been here now for, you've arrived yesterday, I think? The day before the yesterday. The day before yesterday. Yeah. And um, why did you come uh, uh, to the Netherlands? What did you want to discuss or why are you here and why did you talk to the Dutch politicians? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you for hosting me here and this is a great opportunity for me to be here and to share with you our story in Iraq and women's fact in Iraq. 
Of course, I am here because I've been, um, I am with Karama Network, and we are doing the advocacy every time to raise our voice, amplify the voice of women on international base, and to talk about the challenges that women are facing, and also to seek the solidarity and the support of international community to our society and to women in Iraq. So this is why I am here. And um, um, your work basis is in Mosul? Uh, our, um, like, women empowerment organization based uh, in Erbil, but we are working in different provinces in Iraq, in Mosul, in Diyala, in Kirkuk, uh, in addition to KRG, which is Lemani and Dohuk Erbil, and also working in Baghdad. Uh, and this is due to the uh, new situation after the attack of ISIS in 2014. There was a big uh, demand and need of help and assistance for the people who displaced from Mosul, and they came to Erbil, came to Kurdistan, to Sleimania, to Duhok and Erbil, and also we provided assistance to people in, in Mosul, especially after the liberation of Mosul, with the, the liberation process, because our, our team, they were uh, following the military team and providing the assistance and services for the people there and the IDPs within 72 hours that they arrived to the, the camps there. So this is how we are working. Yeah, and you were one of the first um, to arrive in Mosul. I, actually, we have, we, we can show it maybe. It's a really short yeah, clip. Please. Yeah, please. Yeah, it, it, it's actually you arriving in Mosul just the day after it was liberated? Yeah, it, it, uh, as I said, uh, our team, they were following the armies yeah. and to support the, the people. And even they get under the fire of ISIS because it, it was the fight between ISIS and and the military, but our people, they were there and supporting the, the people, and even they were in, in very bad situation because they can see very yeah. bad images of the dead people on streets, but again, because it's the purpose to support the people there and to provide all the humanitarian assistance. Yeah, so let's watch the short clip. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is the truck that taking to Mosul and to provide all the humanitarian assistance to the people there. So what, what kind of day was that for you? Because you had to leave Mosul earlier and, and you came back. Uh, yes, because in 2014, like many people who felt in, in Mosul, they came to Kurdistan, but many others who stayed there because they cannot go out anymore and because maybe most of the people, they don't have money or they don't have car, any facilities to go out. So they stayed there. Uh, uh, so those people stayed under the control of ISIS, and there was very difficult to go to Mosul anymore. But after the liberation, so this is how again uh, we want uh, we went there again, and to uh, to follow the army. So they are cleaning the areas, and we are following them. So this is how we entered, and now we have our offices in, inside Mosul and inside the camps in Mosul, still continuing providing the assistance like uh, child protection and also the services for women, especially GBV, and uh, like distributing uh, dignity kits uh, for women and, and girls and uh, supporting them with psychosocial support and mental health. Because, because um we are talking about what's going on there. We want to know that so we can bring people also to justice. What kind of things do you encounter with the people who are there? What, what kind of victims do you find there? If they are victims, of course. Yeah. 
of course, what happened to to the people there, it's uh, like um, beyond understanding. It's uh, what happened to people like uh, men, women, boys, girls, and because they killed uh, like men and kidnapped the women, raped them, and recruit the children, the boys, for uh, like to fight with them. So this is what happened to six uh, six thousand eight hundred of Ye Yazidi that been kidnapped by ISIS. Of course, there's also from Christian. There's also from Turkmen who also been kidnapped. But the problem they don't want to talk about it and to tell because they feel this is an effect on their honor. But only for Yazidi who announced, they said, they told all international people that what happened to them and because also with Yazidi, it was on, they, they were the biggest victims in, in this conflict. And they really targeted by ISIS. So many women been raped, and many children were born from this rape. Only UNHCR registered 800 of children born from this sex slavery. And, and the, again, the problem, even after the liberation, like many women who came back with children, many women, they are or like pregnant, uh, so, th and, and many women who don't want to come back because they want to keep their children. The problem with Yazidi society also, that the concept is those children, they are Muslim children, so they cannot take care about them. So the mothers, they have to, to leave them in a mosque because they are a Muslim children. Uh, so uh, not related to them. So this is a, a very big problem to Yazidi woman that been raped and now she, she has her baby that not accepted by her family and she has to, to, to leave it to others. So this is uh, for, for women, for mothers, it is difficult to leave her children. If it is from Muslim or Christian or Yazidi, it's her children, it's her baby. So she want to keep them. Um, and the other problem with the registration, like those children, they don't have ID. There is no father, there is no marriage. And even the marriage, if there's a marriage uh, like registration, but this is under ISIS terror. So, it is not recognized by government this is a real marriage. So how they can register those people? So what will be the future of those children? Another problem with the pregnant women. Many women, even before the liberation of Mosul, they escaped and they came back, but they, they were pregnant. And the problem, we don't uh, uh, like, it is not allowed or forbidden in, in our uh, like culture and law uh, to uh, like ab abortion. So this is, even if it is from rape, again, they cannot do the abortion for her. And then when the baby, she delivered the baby, again, they cannot accept the baby. So what's the solution mm -hmm. to kill uh, the baby or to make the abortion. So there's no logic. We don't know what's the logic with the understanding of this culture or, or with law. Why we cannot change law? What's the problem with law? This is again, it's not Quran that we can say there is no change, but this is a law and we have to change according to yeah. the changes and needs. So this is very big problems that women victims of this conflict facing but with no response response and there's no a real health services mental 
services like psychosocial support and rehabilitation, integration of those people again in this society. Now we can see everyone saying, okay, congratulations. Now Iraq is free of ISIS, there is no ISIS. Iraq liberated Mosul and defeat ISIS. Okay, but the concept is there. The concept ideology of ISIS is there. And the mistrust between the people, who can trust who? The Yazidi cannot trust Arab, cannot trust Muslim, and they cannot trust the state because the state cannot, couldn't protect them. And what happened to them due to the weakness of the state? So how can they stay and live in this country? And how they can go back when they are saying, okay, now your area been liberated, so you have to go back. So in which term of trust and security they can go? And every time they saying, okay, if we are going back, but maybe this will happen again, who is protecting us? And again, the example for Christian people, what happened to Christian also they, like, they destroyed all the things for Christian with all the churches, with all the things that had, they had in the area. So now, why they have to go back? There's no any connection between them and between the area. The area, it's totally being changed because people, they would like to go back to their area because still their house is there and the church is there, the school, the hospital, but if everything is destroyed, why I'm going back to this area? What I'm doing there? But, you know, in, in media, when they saying now it's ISIS out, so everyone has to go back. It is easy. And when they asking the people, you have to go back, otherwise we will cut your salary. Okay, many people went back to, to the area because they want to receive their salary. It means under pressure. It's not by their will, they are going back. So what did you, when you came to the um, uh, politicians this morning, I, I'm pretty sure, well actually I know it because I watched the live stream, but I'm pretty sure they asked you, what should the Western community, how can they help you, or what do you expect of them? What would you ask of us who are maybe under the impression ISIS is gone, so now things will get better? First, we have to thank all the efforts and support from European country, and especially Dutch, because they supported the people. And it is not only the support of military support and uh, like the training and capacity building, uh, but also they supported the people. They supported the Yazidian people they supported many civil society organizations to provide the services and they opened the door for the victims and for the people who are living under risk. But what we are asking more to continue this kind of support and solidarity for the people. And because, you know, the only hope for the people is with the international community. And even it is not only that the people want to go outside and live in Europe, no. They, they prefer to have the peace and security in their country. They love that the international community put a pressure on the government to take care more about the people and provide the services and to have to end the impunity and to have access to justice for people, accountability, to be able to live together. How people can live together if there is no accountability, if there is no access to justice, if they cannot punish the preparator that raped their girls, daughters, wife, 
and they looted their house, how they can live together as their neighbor. So the state has to take action, but who can put a pressure on our state? So it's international community and the commitment of all the international law and the convention that they adopted and signed. So this is what we need, the moral support, the, the, like the political support. This is what we need from yeah. international community. And, and because you speak to all those people now in Mosul, do you hear them say that there were many people among the people that committed these atrocities that were not uh, from Syria or Iraq, but came from Europe? Yeah, of course, uh, you know, because we also um, know that ISIS, it's a group who came from outside. Uh, and first, they've been in Sur Syria, but also because the border, it's the same border with Iraq, so they uh, also uh, interfere in Iraq. But we know that there's many uh, nationality with ISIS, which came from Europe and also came from Africa. Uh, but this needs a real investigation to know who's those people and why they involved. Uh, and also many people from Iraq and Mosul who involved with ISIS. So, but of course, for Iraq, we know the reason behind, because they were the marginalized uh, people, and also maybe the, the poor people, the, or the people that they were under threat of ISIS. But this is, it stays with no answers for the people who came from Europe. Why and what is the reason? And I think this is more related to, like, for the security of Dutch to do more investigation on, on this. Because if they are keeping going and uh, getting insights, so still the risk is there. Because one of the things that you hear quite often when we in the Netherlands talk about finding evidence, it is that it's so difficult to gather evidence. But if I hear you talking, you say, well, there is a lot of opportunity to gather this evidence of what has happened. Or is that difficult? You know, it's with the documentation of the cases, especially uh, in, in Kurdistan, uh, they established with a special center. It's like a, a special center to investigate in all the cases, especially of Yazidi, with collecting all the evidence and witnesses on their cases. So maybe this will be helpful also and the problem still, this is like also which brought the, this like made the people disappointed because they start to talk about their story, giving all the evidence for their cases, but again a state like an archive file in the center. So what is the purpose in collecting all this information if there is no any process for punishing the perpetrators or any kind of subsidized, uh, if we are just uh, getting them, and this is how they may be losing the trust for the new cases they don't want to talk about. So there should be some kind of like collaboration for these uh, institutions, how we can help the institution to become more <coughs> professional in doing the work and for what? There's like the government, they promised since they are not uh, a member of uh, the International uh, uh, Criminal Court, they will establish a national court in Iraq to look in those cases, but nothing happened. And I think they prepared all this thing to preparing them for this national court. Yeah. And even 
there's nothing about this national court. So these things, it is very essential to, to follow up and to put a pressure, more pressure on it. Yeah. Because of course they don't want to, to have this kind of court and they don't want to open this kind of files. Maybe there's many people who belong to many parties, so they yeah. don't want to. So maybe not only look for your own <laughs> fighters abroad, but try to establish a framework that works in Iraq and can help together. Yeah, others. because yeah. Uh, every time there's other solutions. If you don't want to be a member in this court, so what's your solution? Yeah. So this is a solution to establish a national court and to, to, to be uh, like with a qualified yeah. uh, investigators and, and to like maybe to get some kind of capacity building trainings, but nothing been happened. So these cases will be like uh, old and people will forget about it, but also they will disappoint people and this mistrust will lead to another conflict. Yeah. It is not only this is make it okay, forget about it. It's not the matter of forget about it. This will create a bigger problem if we forget about it. Yeah. I think Bibi van Ginkel can say in a few moments something about what is being tried or done by European countries. But to, to, to show, because actually the point that you've been making quite eloquently all the time is that after maybe the conflict, the conflict has left. The conflict is still there in many ways. Yeah. And there's another uh, person from your organization, Karama, who made quite an impressive documentary. And we can show a small part, seven minutes of it. Um, and maybe you, Elizabeth, can tell or maybe introduce really short what we're going to see. It's about the mines in Benghazi. What is it? Yes, it's a documentary uh, made by a colleague, Sakha. <coughs> in which it's actually the first uh, movie made by uh, women uh, filmmakers describing what uh, ISIS has done to their city. And what they did is lay self-fabricated mines, but in an absolutely horrific way, because they uh, fabricated mines, including new kind of, well, explosive uh, devices, and laid them specifically in... Um, in schools, in children play yards, which yeah. is horrific. And they said, uh, indeed, since uh, crimes should not go unpunished, they filmed it. And yeah. what they also filmed is the, um, like you said, the, the, the very brave people who are trying to demine them. Um, they're actually civilians wearing all sorts of clothes, but they're civilians. And since they don't have any tools, they're doing it with um, knives and uh, scissors. Yeah. Let's watch it. Well, you are there when you watch it. Is, is, is Mosul comparable to what we've seen here? Is this what happens when ISIS comes? It's the same now for Mosul. Like the same thing that you can, you saw here, it's the same thing like as if it's Mosul. So, um, and even like uh, one of um, our journalists in Erbil, when she went to Mosul just to cover the news there and she died with mine. Yeah, so it's the same. I, I think, <laughs> you know, people will say as a moderator, <laughs> you have to be neutral, but when I say that when it's that, that it's important to prosecute those that commit atrocities. We always tend to think about uh, Bataclan and the attacks that have happened there, but actually maybe we should do it for those people that are suffering under it. Um, and I think that's also a good moment to maybe invite Bibi van Ginkel to come to the floor, give her a warm welcome. Um, <laughs> because if there's someone who can tell us maybe, um, well, first of all, actually my questions are twofold. How do you listen to this? I mean, you, you already study so much about what is going on in these regions, but still you hear it again and again. And can you tell us something about what has been done to prosecute those that have committed crimes in these regions? Well, let me first say I was, I brought my mother here to be with me and we were driving through Amsterdam about 50 years ago. She studied here and we were driving 
past the street where she lived, and she was like, hi, my old house, just waving to the old house, because yeah. it's filled of memories. And that really spoke to me when you showed that. You said, these are, these are the memories and the voice in the, in the video. Um, these are the houses that are part of our lives, of our identity. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, it might seem a minor thing, but it makes who we are. And I think that shows how, how dehumanizing this whole war has been. And, uh, and that's why we need to take an extra effort to make sure that there is no such thing as impunity. As you say, impunity is only the ingredient for the next conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another reason why we uh, have to step up to that. Um, and uh, before I go into the legal part, uh, one other thing, because I'm, I'm not only doing legal work, but, but also working uh, in a project with uh, partners in Erbil and Palestine and Egypt, and very much on a human security approach to countering violent extremism, which is very much about the engagement between government and civil society, because you need to to, to cross bridges and build bridges sometimes, as governments tend to look at these things only through a security lens. And, and they are concerned with the hard security issues and forget about the human security aspects of it, which is all about uh, people and uh, taking a people-centric uh, approach to things, which is about listening and working with people in the communities. And, uh, and, and you're right, in our approach, we also make sure that we bring in the international community exactly to put pressure on governments to actually work with civil society because they don't have uh, a sort of a natural habit to do that. That's, it's in, in, in these regions, it's rather they, uh, they um, perceive civil society organizations, the NGOs, the local uh, community-based organizations, the grassroots level organizations as rather um, almost the enemy uh, who are there to undermine their power. And, and I think they have to overcome that perspective because you cannot do it only from a hard security perspective. You also need to do the other thing. Um, and and this, these approaches are also needed to, to look at this post-conflict uh, situation. And, and dealing with the, uh, the legal aspects, the impunity, is, is just one part of it. So coming back to your question on what is it that, that we can do? Well, uh, first of all, in, in the Netherlands and in, in, in some of the other European countries, um, it's nowadays the policy that for, uh, for all of the people that they know have traveled to these, uh, these regions, Syria and Iraq, that they already started the criminal investigations, maybe even have already started prosecuting them, even if that means that these people are still in the conflict area, so there have been already some convictions uh, uh, with that. That's at least a policy that uh, is being Dutch used. Also Dutch people? Yeah, in, in the Netherlands. So there are investigations and, and, and court cases with people who are still there. Um, and uh, I mean, there have been um, some debate between different courts in the Netherlands on whether or, no, uh, whether or not uh, you can assume that these people are still alive, because sometimes claims are made that they have died, mm -hmm. and, but that's also sometimes used as a cover to get out of prosecution, because they feel if I slip into another identity, I can, uh, mm -hmm. um, I can escape my, my prosecution and my punishment. So that's one, but that's the, the problem there is that um, as it is difficult for various reasons um, to, to collect evidence on uh, the atrocities that have been uh, committed there, and I'll, I'll come back to that later, um, the, 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 the strategies, the prosecutorial strategies that are used are, are rather uh, dealing with membership of an, uh, terrorist organizations, the attempts to travel, the uh, complicity to commit terrorist uh, uh, crimes, the, uh, the planning of terrorist crimes, the preparation uh, to plan uh, terrorist crimes, even though they don't know exactly what terrorist crimes have been committed or crimes against mm -hmm. humanity or well, some some would even uh, make an argument to uh, to yeah. to uh, prosecute for genocide. Yeah, just to shortly interrupt your story before you come yeah. back to collecting evidence, and I'm also interesting to hear if you can add something to that. Um, but Peter Omtzigt, who unfortunately is not here, tries yeah. to make this whole procedural prosecutorial route a bit easier by saying 
and he pushed it um, that, that, that the Netherlands is, is, is trying to attempt to make sure that it happens all across Europe to say that those who traveled to Syria are complicit to genocide. If, if, if we accept that genocide has been taken place by ISIS, then we can prosecute those that traveled there under the, and we have to prosecute those mm -hmm. under the uh, name of genocide. Is that something that could work? Well, uh, uh, let me say it like this. Uh, the, the Genocide Convention is indeed, uh, um, of course, signed uh, by uh, the Netherlands and, and many, many other countries as well. And you can even uh, consider it as customary international law, and it's certainly uh, a war crime. So there are all kinds of reasons why uh, you can, uh, and states can prosecute. It has, it has universal jurisdiction, which means that uh, practically, uh, 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 in fact, every country can, uh, can prosecute whatever crime of genocide is committed wh wherever and by whomever. So it doesn't necessarily have to meet, mean that there is a territorial connection or a personal connection with either the victim or the perpetrator. That's what universal jurisdiction means. Mm -hmm. The Genocide Convention, which is of course more specific on, on what it entails, what, what the crime of genocide entails and what the obligations are, uh, indeed prohibits um, the commission of a genocide, clearly, uh, but also puts like a positive obligation on states to prevent it and to prosecute the, the, the atrocities, meaning that they have to include it in their national uh, criminal law system and act upon it if, if they do so. Now, there are two things to that, because there is the criminal, uh, the individual criminal um, have responsibility, which is uh, related to crimes committed by individuals. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one trajectory that you could go, but there is also the state responsibility side of it. So states have an obligation to prevent and to actually make sure that prosecution takes place. Now that's an interesting um, uh, aspect of the Geneva Convention on which also the International Court of Justice ruled in, I think it was February 2007, mm -hmm. in the case between Bosnia-Herzegovina and, and Serbia, where Bosnia-Herzegovina <coughs> accused Serbia of committing genocide. Now the court at that point ruled that that was very hard to prove because for the um, commission of genocide, you have to prove the intent to destroy completely or partly a specific group, ethnic, religious uh, uh, a group. And, and this intent part, uh, it's very hard to prove that that is really there. So they said, well, there have been certainly been mass murders, but the crime of genocide, except for Srebrenica, mm. has not been proved. But the court also said um, there is still this sort of passive, uh, not this direct, but sort of indirect responsibility in the sense that Serbia did not do enough to prevent this from happening. Now, uh, in the case of Srebrenica, because there indeed they established that, Srebren that uh, genocide is committed. Now, this is an interesting thing to think about. If we translate it to Syria. If we translate it to Syria and Iraq, Because the point that uh, Peter Omzert is, uh, is making, and uh, by default, if he's not there, let me briefly explain. Uh, he wants to uh, call upon uh, mm. uh, all member states, uh, basically, uh, of the Council of Europe, but also wider, also to the UN, etc., uh, that states actually make a case of prosecuting the perpetrators for genocide or and uh, crimes against humanity or war crimes. Now. He mentions uh, how the focus has mostly been on genocide, and particularly with regard to the Yazidi. Um, uh, there have been more uh, reports that, that pointed out that that might indeed have been the case. Prosecuting this uh, before the International Criminal Court has been um, an, a route that, that for now has been mm -hmm. barred, because Syria and Iraq are not members of the International Criminal Court, so they have not accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court huh, in advance. But the alternative would be that there is a referral by the Security Council, but the Security Council... Of which we are a member now. Of which we are a member now, but there are also a couple of other members there who have a permanent seat mm -hmm. and a veto, and uh, particularly Russia is vetoing this, this um, trajectory, this avenue yeah. to take. Yeah. Yeah. Suzanne, is that also why you push so much towards an institution 
or, uh, or because the criminal court cannot, Iraq is not a member of it, you try to push to countries to push Iraq to do it themselves, right? Yeah, exactly, be Be because if we like uh, lost the hope uh, for Iraq to become member in the international criminal court, so the other solution to establish its court, national court, looking for those cases. Uh, and they promised for this, and it, we were optimistic to, to establish this kind of work, and this is why they start to collect all the evidence and document the cases, but we couldn't see anything, any progress, any improvement on, on this regard. So this means they don't want, and this is not in their interest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because maybe many people who've been affiliated in this and many of uh, like things will appear and shows who involved in, in this. Yeah. So it's yeah. better to, to keep it like this. Yeah. Yeah. In any case, uh, even if the International Criminal Court uh, would be able to take the case, uh, it would still only be a complementary jurisdiction. And that's a fancy word for saying it's first up to a, a state itself, a national jurisdiction to prosecute, and only if they fail to do so or refuse to do so, the jurisdiction is, and so the mandate is on the International Criminal Court. So in any case, it would be the national courts and the national prosecutors that need to do so, not only for uh, the people in Iraq, Syria, but everywhere yeah. else. And, and just one, one last thought, because as I mentioned, this genocide case, um, which is for the International Criminal Court, and this is the, uh, the Peace Palace in The Hague, that's the court that uh, de deals with disputes mm -hmm. between countries, there might be an issue, or there might be an, an idea to, to bring either Syria or Iraq before the International Criminal Court if they fail to actually take action, or any other country who fails to take action on the, the prevention or the prosecution of, of yeah. genocide. So yeah. that's still, but that's a long route, yeah. that, let me say that, yeah. yeah. But I, th uh, yeah. I, I think it is difficult, like, uh, in, uh, like for Iraq, for example, even if Iraq member in the International Criminal Court, it is difficult to look at 10,000 of cases. So it should be only special cases to be referred to this International Criminal Court. What do you mean so by that, special cases? Uh, special cases, it means very, like, I don't think that with the cases of, um, like the rape, to, to be like all these cases to go to international court. So maybe this national court, it is a solution, but for the, the cases that it is internationally involved, so maybe this is, it should be looked at the international court. So in, in both cases that we have to establish this mm -hmm. national court to look at all the cases that happened only for the very complicated cases that yeah, has yeah, to go yeah. to this. Um, before, because maybe it's time to think about if you have any questions, because I want to, um, the, yeah, just one question and then I come to you. <laughs> um, the thing we've been talking about is a lot uh, uh, about evidence and trying to collect it and how difficult yeah. it is. And you've, uh, well, you've read it, in, you wrote it in the newspaper quite sometimes, you opt for the military to help doing that, because that's maybe the holy grail. If we can collect the evidence, then yeah. we can prosecute, prosecute the people yeah. who committed the crimes. Can you say something shortly yeah. about that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, collecting the evidence is, is very difficult. It's already difficult uh, for the authorities in Syria and Iraq. Uh, in some areas, they can still not operate, not like the civilian investigators uh, or, or uh, prosecutors because it's just chaos and, and still too dangerous to operate, except that you have some brave men and women who, who go in anyway uh, to uh, dismantle the, the mines, but to do the actual research. Because what would be interesting from a prosecutorial perspective is whether these mines that they're dismantling have any fingerprints on them. Because that would be evidence in court of someone who actually had uh, plans to, to kill. Uh, and that's the kind of evidence that we're looking for uh, in, um, in contrast to just prosecuting someone from membership of an organization. Yeah. Now, 
a Dutch prosecutor might also be interested because it might be a Dutch foreign fighter. Yeah. And he can also not, he doesn't have the mandate to operate there, etc. Now, uh, a project that we are working on with the UN um, is to develop guidelines uh, on how the military, who in, in many of these situations are already there, they are operating in these areas, either still fighting uh, terrorist organizations or uh, um, making it safe. Um, um, and they are, they, are, they are there, they are the feet on the ground. And even though this should not be their prime task, in the meantime, they can, they can help and they can um, uh, be equipped with some small evidence kits and, and, and know a little bit about the rules. And then the prosecutors should also know on how to work with yeah. that. Yeah. So those are the guidelines that we're developing and this is within UN, in addition to a lot of other international uh, yeah. initiatives that are being developed to actually yeah. work and, and make sure that the evidence that is collected, that it will actually find its way to the courts to, yeah. uh, to uh, start the Be Because, Susan, to come back one more time to the short movie we saw of you driving into Mosul, you were actually driving behind those military. Um, did you at that moment realize immediately that this was also the evidence that you were wandering just into? H how did you see that? Yeah, one big crime scene. Um, uh, you know, because uh, this is like for <coughs> following the military. It's again, yes, because we we can witness everything like with this. But with with the military, it was not against the citizen, not against the families. It's against ISIS. Mm. So they helping the people. So there was no this kind of abuses. But what it happened, like, for example, when the militia, after the conflict, after the referendum, the conflict between the two governments, like federal with KRG, and especially with the areas that it, there's a conflict, it is somehow the Kurdish, government saying this is belong to me and Baghdad saying no it's belong to me so when militia came again the same thing happened because they were against the Kurd people who living in the area that it's belong that they saying it's belong so again the same displaced people you can see you can imagine it is not only ISIS who affected on the people in Iraq. The people who moved back after ISIS to, to live in their place, and then the conflict between the two governments and the militia came, and again, they raped the women. And the, it's Iraqi, Iraqi. So, but this military, we were following them. They are against ISIS. And this is how they witnessed a case of Yazidi woman. She married to ISIS and she delivered a two kids. So she she's with her two kids. And the the military taking her back to take her back to her family and she rejecting that she crying she want to stay with her children and maybe to find her way to go with her husband so this is you can the tragedy you can see of women that she refused to go back to the family and preferring to stay with the husband of ISIS because she wants to keep the two children that she, she is sure that the family will refuse yeah. those children. Yeah. So this is what we witnessed yeah. through like the military. But of course, after the referendum, also everything <laughs> being changed because also we are coming from Arbil, the Kurdish side, also like their attitude being changed with us for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah.
I promised you to come to you for a question. Yes, well, um, it's a half a question. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, all those fighters uh, who joined Daesh in, uh, in Syria or Iraq will ever be punished by uh, genocide, for example, because uh, this is too complicated. But in this resolution of the, the General Assembly, or the Parliamentary Assembly of uh, the Council of Europe, uh, Switzerland brought in that the Assembly welcomes the establishment of the International Impartial Independent Mechanism, the IIIM, uh, to assist the investigation and prosecution of persons responsible for the most serious crimes under international law committed in the Syrian Arab Republic. So this is, uh, and when this is uh, adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, then it might be possible to the international the ICC in The Hague to, to set up a court. Is this correct or not? No, uh, so uh, for the ICC, um, uh, there are various ways in which the International Criminal Court who has an, uh, is prosecuting it for individual criminal responsibility of individuals. Uh, that's different from what states are doing. Um, uh, only if, if uh, jurisdiction has been uh, accepted by that state. So for Syria and Iraq, for the people who are actually there, um, I, you need some form of territorial um, relation, and, and they haven't accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC, so uh, it, it's not a, a bypassing. The only way that, that um, the ICC uh, would get involved, this is also being uh, suggested in the, uh, the, the motion that was accepted by the General Assembly of the Council of Europe, the motion that Peter Omtzigt uh, um, um, has put forward is that there is come some kind of a personal uh, jurisdiction for uh, the ones that actually travel back. So for instance, a, a Dutch um, foreign fighter who committed these kind of crimes. Um, for that one, because the Netherlands has accepted the jurisdiction of, of the ICC, ICC could prosecute, except that first they will look whether the state itself will prosecute. And in, in the case of the Netherlands, you will possibly see that huh? they will prosecute themselves. But you, your, your earlier remark, the fact that uh, prosecution for genocide is, is very unlikely uh, because that's, such, that's like the holy grail of uh, international crimes. That's, that's so difficult to prove. So, but there are all kinds of uh, crimes against humanity, crimes against uh, uh, war crimes and, and even terrorism crimes that can be prosecuted um, yeah, yeah. by any court. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. What kind of evidence uh, is there? Uh, you, you mentioned fingerprints on, on bombs, but yeah. on mines, but what kind of uh, evidence can we think of? Maybe first, Suzanne, and because... Yeah. You're there, and then Bibi can respond. I is there something to say about evidence? Yeah. What kind of evidence can we find? Yeah. Uh, what kind of evidence? Maybe uh, witnesses, like they can, uh, like people who saw the, like, the case, so they can give their witnesses. So this is one of evidence, or maybe the victims. She know very well the person. Uh, so this is also from uh, the evidence. So th there's many, like many kind of evidence, but the problem with evidence every time, the security of the people, because many time, like people who refuse give their witnesses because there's no security for yeah. them. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Bibi? Yeah, no, indeed. The, so witnesses, the, the stories of witnesses is, is indeed very important. That's not uh, being used uh, so far or hardly, but uh, your point is absolutely right. So this is one of the parts that we will be covering in the, in the guidelines that we're developing is actually to make sure that you take into account the, the, the safety and the security of the witnesses. So sometimes that means that they, you have to uh, use them um, but as, as covered witnesses so they are not publicly known. Um, 
there you sometimes you might also run into other practical problems like in, in, in cultural settings where um, uh, the, the women feel embarrassed to talk to investigators so they have men instead tell their story but then it's a second hand story or the chief of the of the community is the one talking to but that was not the one uh, the, 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 the eyewitness so but witness stories are important you have your fingerprint uh, your technical evidence that you can collect your forensic evidence uh, there's also a lot of what we call e-evidence that is electronic evidence, the, the, the kind of evidence you find uh, on social media, that's what a lot of the, the national prosecutors are basing their, their cases on at the moment. They How strong is that? If you have a it, Facebook it, it photo? Holds in, it holds in court, but of course you have to, um, if you are uh, trying to make a picture of a broader, um, a, a picture of what has actually happened in a certain area, uh, you have to um, be aware that there is a certain bias in the collection uh, of evidence yeah. because it's, it's most likely that a certain uh, demographic group is more prone to be um, uh, making uh, movies that can be used as evidence or uh, tweeting about it uh, if yeah. they are the ones collecting it. Uh, and, others, and other atrocities are not recorded because uh, the other party is not that savvy with all the electronic devices and not thinking of that. So that's one part of it. And the other is, is that they are looking at the kind of posting of the perpetrators themselves. Because there have been a lot of perpetrators who certainly in the beginning were you know, taking pictures with beheaded uh, people or uh, uh, mm. uh, with manslaughters, uh, mm. uh, mass slaughters. Uh, Etc. And, and just the fact that they are posing with weapons and flags, at, at in some cases in, in Europe, Could have be already enough. been enough to uh, convict them for being part uh, or member of a terrorist organization. Now, as I said, that's not what we're looking yeah. for because it's not really um, uh, doing justice to the victims for the actual crimes yeah. that have been committed. Um, I would suggest to do two more questions because it's, it's been a really long day, I guess, and it's also about time to go to the um. bar. Yes, I come to you. Um, yeah. Yes. What do you know about uh, the foreign wives of foreign fighters? Who are they guilty or not? Uh, and what about the children? There's a lot of talk about here also that their children could be dangerous too. And I know that some of them are captured in Kurdish camps. So, what is their fate, and what should be their fate? Uh, sorry about the children. They are uh, recruited well, like of the wives of uh, f uh, foreign fighters. These foreign wives are they guilty also of war crimes, as far as you know? And what should happen with their small children? Um, they're captured. Some of them are captured in in Kurdish camps in uh, in Syria somewhere. Yeah, for uh, the the foreign fighters, <coughs> of course, since they involved with ISIS and they. Uh, like uh, again killing and raping so of course they are guilty and they have yeah but and uh, for the children and the wives wives the women. Uh, yes this is this is a big problem and there's a big discussion on this on uh, the fighters uh, wives like if they are also guilty or not and some of them, they already in prisons because they saying they are uh, ISIS wives. Mm -hmm. But they, and some of those, uh, these women, they are saying they are, they been divorced and, uh, but there's no any kind of cer certificate to prove. And some of the women, uh, of course, they, they also were helping uh, the fighter. And they, they were uh, like punishing the other women who without the real ISIS uh, hijab. Uh, and also if there's any women who uh, using makeup, so those women who biting them uh, as a punishment. So this is, we cannot say that uh, the wives, they are not guilty. Maybe we can, uh, like, I'm not the person to say this is guilty and this is not guilty. It should be go through investigation 
to see if she, because many of the wives, they are uh, wife under pressure, like for Yazidi, they, they became a wife because they were, uh, they've been kidnapped. They are not with their will the wife of the fighter. But there's also many women who came with ISIS. They are ISIS again, I even they are women, but they are ISIS. So this is, it should go through investigation to prove if they are guilty or not guilty. Mm. And what about the children, to, to, to finish the question? The, uh, about children, children stays children. They are under age of 18. So it is not, they, uh, so they have to go with uh, like treatment and to mental health, uh, psychosocial support for them, and how to clean their mind, how to, to change their behavior because uh, we cannot uh, punish children on anything. They were um, being pushing to do to the, this kind of crimes. Is there anyone who wants to ask the last question? I saw a really mm -hmm. <laughs> doubtful hand. Hesitating. I apologize, I probably won't formulate it well, so apologies, but um, this is, of course, you mentioned ICC and all sort of, if I can put it, sort of Western type uh, forms of jurisdiction and things like that. But I was wondering, is there also an Islamic approach or different interpretation of t Islamic uh, law that you could use to for foreign fighters and to bring out a verdict about it? Is, is there anything known about this? Is my question a bit clear? Well, uh, let me say, first, how these, these crimes are considered international crimes, eh? universal crimes. So the entire international community has decided at one point that we don't accept these kind of crimes. Now, uh, it's, it's up to states how they translate that into their own criminal co code. So uh, there are cultural differences. There are also, uh, between European countries, you already see differences. Um, so th th there could be uh, a more of an, a cultural flavor to the way that that uh, is, is translated to um, uh, to the region um, I don't know I know that uh, under the organization of uh, Islamic countries they have also have an, a treaty in which they actually uh, one of the only or, or, or you only see that in regional or, or conventions that they uh, come up with a definition of uh, the crime of terrorism and that puts an obligation on the states there also to put that in their, their law. Um, I, know, I know I can refer you to an author who has written a very thick book on that. <laughs> but uh, That's good I, for I, must, the bar. I, must, yeah. I must admit, I haven't read it. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, is there something to say about how maybe also uh, Islamic states or, or, or can, can, can is, is that an issue or is it not in, in play at all? No, because again, this is crime, and even in mm. in local law, again, this is crime, and uh, even in Islamic um, uh, like point of view, it's crime. Yeah. I would before um, 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 I, I give you the last word. I, w I would first like to thank you over here. I would also like to thank Bibi for being here and also so eloquently explaining what Peter Omzicht could have said. Um, so please give Bibi a warm. <laughs> Uh, hands for that. Thank you. And um, Susan, before I, I, I want to thank you, I, I, I just want to give you some sort of last word, maybe, because w when we're leaving this hall, um, is there something that you maybe said this morning to the politicians or that you keep repeating to people when you come to the Netherlands or to any other country about what we should realize um, and yeah. what's important for you? Yeah, what is important, uh, like, Women participation, women experience, women perspective. Women, they have to be part of the solution, part of the peace agreement, reconciliation, rebuilding Iraq. Because what we can see now with all this, what happened and women, they paid the big price and they became uh, the big victims, but now excluding them from all the negotiation. So this is how we are trying to, uh, like how to, to give more space for women and how 
international community can support us and and like first for women leadership in in rebuilding Iraq and the reconciliation women should be on the top on it hashtag times up I would yeah. say <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah well keep up the good work I would say and thank I you. would like to thank you so much for being here yeah. um, give her an end of applause Susan Aref My pleasure to be here. Good. And, and I'd like to thank Elizabeth for helping me putting this together. I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, have a safe trip home. The bar is also open for the third half, which is also always uh, important <laughs> as well. So I hope to see you at the bar and next time here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Thank you.